So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Tableau Analytic uh, User Group. It's the first time that uh, we are in Baby, so um, we try to figure out a lot of things. So we are very sorry if you are uh, experiencing some difficulty joining. Uh, but next time <laughs> we will be better, we promise. So the analytic Tableau user group is a little bit different because we won't like to uh, make it about analytic all the time. We don't um, present a use case. Uh, so usually we really uh, like to have demo on Tableau uh, desktop, web edit or app data. And it's really uh, analytic all the time. So um, if you... Uh, haven't, haven't registered and you just found this video on YouTube, um, please make sure to register. Here you have, and you can also uh, follow us on the forum. I will copy paste again uh, our YouTube um, channel link or forum and where you can register. And yes, please continue to say where you are joining from. It's always very funny. Uh, so <coughs> um, we are like three leaders on the user group. We have uh, Prasam, so I think it's very late for him, but if he's here anyway, uh, we say hello. Uh, we have Shimdi, who is uh, co-leading uh, today with me. Uh, Shimdi is a database manager for Postmedia Network. And uh, myself, Annabel Rincon, I'm leading the Tableau Center of uh, Enablement at uh, Fontobel, a Swiss bank. So we are like uh, all from all over the world. And I hopefully one day we will be together in one conference, Shimdi. <laughs> That's coming so, soon. <laughs> exactly. Like just uh, some word about me. Like I said, I'm leading the Tableau Center of Enablement. Uh, my passion in life are like uh, obviously uh, the one there, Tableau and Chocolate, uh, like a big part of it. And I'm also co-leading Data Plus Women, uh, an initiative to promote women working with or around data. If you want to register, please feel free to do so. <laughs> I will be happy to have you. And then, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm sick, <laughs> so I'm trying not to speak too much. We have Prasam. Prasam is a Tableau visionary, social ambassador, and um, is uh, co-leading uh, the uh, tug for when you, it's US APAC friendly. So um, the next session will be in June. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, Pras, uh, yeah. So, Let's uh, let's move on to, because we're already late. <laughs> Shimdi here with me. Uh, I really appreciate uh, everything uh, both Prasam and Shimdi are doing for um, in Tableau Public and for the Tableau community. So I'm very happy to have them uh, with me on this journey. And um, Shimdi is a data list manager at Postmedia. Uh, he does, if you don't follow him on Tableau Public, I don't know what you are doing because he does wonderful database design. And uh, <clears throat> he really enjoyed doing that. And we can see that uh, obviously it's, uh, it's uh, very relevant. <clears throat> so I will let Shimdi talk uh, and introduce uh, the speaker. If you have any question, please use the Q&A uh, and we will answer. And if you just want to say where you are coming from, the chat is a perfect place to uh, do so. And don't worry, the session is being recorded and we will post it uh, later, the link. Uh, the YouTube link. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Annabelle. So today we've got three amazing speakers and I'm going to jump right into our first one here. Um, I think Andy is definitely no stranger to the community. So he's the global head coach of the data school. And as far as his Tableau journey, he started using Tableau in 2007. So like definitely, you know, been on there for a long time. As we can tell, he's just super knowledgeable. He is the first ever Tableau blogger, which is fantastic. I don't know if you've seen like his old business.com blog, but you should definitely check it out. Lots of amazing Tableau stuff there. He created uh, the first community project, Makeover Monday, um, which I don't need to introduce to any of you here, hopefully. Same thing with Workout Wednesday. These are just, you know, programs that have really helped the community. And so, of course, you know, we're really happy to have Andy here to share his knowledge. Fun fact, over this past uh, weekend, Andy completed his first full distance Ironman Saturday in, Te in, in Texas on Saturday. Um, I've never done this. I don't know whoever has done this, but I'm sure we all understand this is like an amazing feat. So congratulations, Andy. Um, and Andy today is going to be talking to us about Tableau techniques for top-notch top spatial analytics. 
And so I'm going to pass it off to Andy so we can learn a little bit about math and spatial analytics. And um, Andy, over to you now. Yeah, great. Thank you. I, I tried to make the presentation title as, as uh, much of a tongue twister as possible. So <laughs> it, it sounded like it worked when you were trying to read that out. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. And thank you for having me. I had no idea that this user group was so gigantic. I think uh, the, what is it, the, um, the newbie? Uh, user group, I think, that Jim runs with Klaus. I think that has like several thousand members as well. So uh, really well done to you all for, for growing it like you have. It's pretty cool. We we um, are the biggest one. And we even received like uh, a VZs last year. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, all right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, let's see. Entire screen. Okay. So you should see yourselves now, and I can click on hide. Oops, can you still, you can still see my screen, right? Hopefully, yes? Uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> it's like, did I just get disconnected? Yeah. Okay, so um, one of the, I mean, spatial is my absolute favorite thing to teach at the data school. Um, and we do a lot of it in Alteryx and we do a lot of it in Tableau. I'm going to take you through four different um, examples, depending on how much time do I have? 30 minutes? How much uh, time you need. <laughs> I think we're good. Okay. I'll, I'll just keep going until somebody cuts me off. How about that? Um, so Perfect. I'm going to show you, um, we're going to look at a couple of things. We're going to look at the London bus network. Uh, we're going to look at airline routes, <clears throat> and I'm going to explain some of the differences in how data has to be shaped in Tableau in order to draw these things. Um, we're going to then look at uh, hurricanes and um, hurricanes and tropical storms in the North Atlantic, and we're going to use kind of maybe the intersects function to see which of those hit each state. And then the last thing, we're going to wrap up with looking at some data about rats in New York. This is my absolute favorite data set. Uh, so in New York, you can call 311, report a rat location, and that data is actually collected. So really, really obscure but interesting data set. And we're going to wrap it up with an emoji map that shows where cats are going to be most excited to find the rats. So hopefully you'll enjoy that one when it comes around. That's, that's It's really fun. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to connect to some data here. And uh, oh, what happened to my, there we go and I wisely put them all in the same spot. So uh, I'm just gonna start with this bus stops data. And this data set is pretty simple. We have the, the, uh, the route, and hopefully I'll just draw this down here. We've got the route, and the sequence field means, you know, which stop number is it along the route? So the first stop, second stop, et cetera. And then the name of the stop, so these are um, unique for each route and sequence combination. And then the actual location of the bus route. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is that Tableau does a sampling of the data uh, when it determines what the data type is. And you'll notice this one came in as a continuous measure uh, because Tableau scanned the data and said, oh, this looks like numbers. Well, the problem is they're not all numbers. Some of them have a letter in them, like there is an X26 bus. Uh, I used to ride a bus, a bus that was the H37. So if we leave this as a continuous number, it is going to, those records are going to fall out of the data set and we don't want that. So I'm gonna change the, uh, the data type to a string, but notice Tableau still, if I zoom in on my screen, if I zoom in, can you see that zoomed in? Or is it yes. still the same? You can, okay, good, uh, thank you. Um, so notice how it's still green. Hopefully you can see it's green. So. What I really want is I want it, I want it to be uh, discrete, not continuous. So when I go over to my sheet now, Tableau puts it down here. Um, Tableau puts it down here as a measure, and it's just going to try to count the routes. Well, I don't want that. I want, it to, I want those to be discrete items. So I'm just going to drag it up to my dimensions. And there we go. So Tableau will now not automatically aggregate it. So we have these two fields, latitude and longitude. And if I, if I just double click on either of those, or both of those, sorry, I get a single dot that looks like it's in the middle of London. Now, it does that because Tableau has taken the average of all of the latitudes and longitudes. We need to put some kind of dimension in the view, um, or sorry, not a dimension, a discrete field in the view in order to split up the view. 
So in other words, if I now drag the route field onto detail, because it is a discrete dimension, Tableau is going to split up the view by route. Okay, so I'm going to just show the highlighter here and let me find maybe, for example, the H37, the one I used to run or ride, I didn't run it. Um, and you'll see there's just a single dot for the H37. Again, that's because we've told Tableau only split it up by route. What we wanted to do ideally is we wanted to split it up by route and by stop name. Okay, so now if I look at the H37, come on. And I love on a Mac how, how Tableau gives you like the hazard sign, the, uh, what is that, like the poison warning sign or something. Um, so there you can see the H37, but it's not a line, it's just a bunch of dots. So what we wanna do is we wanna change our mark type from automatic, oh, look at that. Interesting, automatic to a line. And I now wanna put the sequence onto the path, but also notice how Tableau put that sequence field down here in the measures. And it did that because it's trying to help you um, by, uh, by sort of categorizing the data. So, but I don't want the sequence field to be aggregated. So I'm gonna drag that up to my dimensions so that by default, it's not aggregated. And now I have a natural sequence, so one through whatever. So I'm gonna put that on the path shelf. And now we can see, uh, let's see, what did I do wrong here? Um, ba -ba -ba, route, stop name. Well, I screwed something up. Oh, this might need to be continuous. Let me see. There we go. OK. Um, no, that didn't do it either. Um, OK. I just did this a little while ago. Come on. At least now it's giving me the rainbow spinner instead of the poison spinner. OK, there we go. Um, so now I could see, for example, the H37, I could see the route for the H37, but that is composed of multiple points. So down here on the very lower left-hand side of Tableau, so down here on the lower left, you can see that we have 28,000 marks. So that's how many things Tableau has drawn in this picture. So there's 28,270 unique combinations of route and stop name. So I'm gonna click on the size and reduce the size all the way down. I don't know why it's putting this little selector thing low down here. And I'm gonna set the color to red because then it can look like buses in London, all right? And it's faded everything out too. So I, I don't know what's going on here. Everything seems to be broken. Right, but what I wanna do now is I want to, um, instead of these being individual points, you see how they're all individual points here. I wanna be able to, um, uh, I want to be able to look at each of these as a solid line. So in other words, the this uh, let me just filter down to Route 81 just to make it easier. Or I'll just do Route 1. doesn't matter. Okay, there's 29 marks if we look down on the lower left because there's 29 stops. But instead of this being 29 marks, I want it to be one mark. So I want to have one line that represents the whole the whole thing. Now, I want to do that because I want to get the distance of each route. If I look at the distance calculation in Tableau, uh, so if I just scroll down to distance, it requires a starting point and an ending point. The problem here is that requires the data to be next to each other, not on top of each other. So if we look at our data set, we have the route and the sequence, so the data goes down. If we want to use the distance function or even the make line function in Tableau, the data has to be side by side. So we either need to reshape the data in Tableau. The problem with that is we would have to have the sequence field all the way across the view. And we have no idea how many sequences we have because every bus route is different. So that's where something like Alteryx comes into play. Um, so over in Alteryx, I've gone ahead and already built my workflow. And if you're not familiar with Alteryx, that's OK. Um, so oops. Thing. So what I've done here is I've just imported the data, and then in Alteryx, I've taken each of the um, each of the stops and turned it into a spatial point. And then there is a tool called uh, PolyBuild that allows me to take each of those points and turn it into a line. So now, if I look at the data in Alteryx, 
you can see I've got all these maps here. So if I click on the number one, you can sort of see it highlighted in this view, but Alteryx is really terrible at visualization. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to, I'll go to a new sheet and I'm gonna to connect to that data source now. And bus routes. And if I go to sheet two, and now if I double click on my, my uh, spatial field that was created in Alteryx, notice I only have one mark now and, it, and it rendered really, really quickly. Now, I only have one mark because I haven't told Tableau how to split up the view. So that's where the route field comes in handy. So if I drag route onto detail, I now get a line for each individual route, right? So notice how, how much quicker the interactivity is. So where's the number one route there, right? So that's one mark. So if you click on it down on the bottom left of the Tableau, you see it's one of 736 marks. Okay, so good. Uh, so what I wanna do now is I wanna know, well, what have, the, what have the, um, uh, the traffic patterns been like for each of these stops over the years? So I'm gonna edit my data source and I'm going to add a second data source. And this one is my bus stats. Okay, and now in my bus stats, I have the route number, the route, and then the how many kilometers it ran, and then um, the usage recorded. That's basically the number of passengers. Okay, so I'm going to double click on my extract to bring up my join window, and I do that because I because I hate the data model. Um, I'm going to bring in a union, and then I'm going to grab each of my fields here or each of my tables. This is one Excel file that has multiple tabs in it. I'm going to bring those into the view. Click on OK. And then now Tableau uh, is trying to join up route and then the route union. OK, so it looks like we're all good there. I have some repeated columns, so I'm going to just hide the route union. The spatial field, um, what do I want? I'm going to rename this just as path, just so it makes a bit more sense to me in my head. And instead of usage recorded, I'm going to call this passengers. And then the sheet field and table field. So these are the names of the sheets in the, um, in the data source. So I'm just gonna call this uh, maybe year. Cause it's just a range of years. It goes 2010 to 2011, 2011, 2012, et cetera. And I don't need this field either. So I'm cleaning up the data as I go along. So let's go back over to our sheet now. And uh, if I put the number of passengers, let's say we put that onto size and we can see, so let me, um, can we see it a bit? Yeah, so it's kind of hard to see here, but some of them are larger than others. Just take, take my word for it. So for example, down here, this one has 8.9 million passengers in that year. Uh, of course, that one has the same 65 million here for the Route 106, et cetera. So 57 million for the Route 4. So people take the bus a lot in London. But what I want to do is um, I want to split this up over across the year. So I'm going to drag the year field. I'm actually going to put it on the pages shelf because I'm interested to know, you know, maybe what was the impact of COVID during this time. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the play button and sort of see what happens. Hopefully it does something here. It's playing. But is it doing anything? Okay, well, something happened there. There you go. So 2020, 2021, we can see ridership goes down. So there's 2019, 20, and then it goes down once we hit COVID uh, somewhere. There we go. Okay, so not very useful. That's okay. So that's part of the analytical process. As you get an idea, it might you might think it's going to be interesting in your head, but it's not. So what I would probably do here instead is maybe look at the route and the passengers and then just sort them that way. And then what I could do is in my tooltip, um, so let me go back here, let me duplicate this sheet, get rid of the year. So what I would do now is in my tooltip, I'm going to just insert the map. So insert sheet uh, two, two, and now let's see if that works, right? So here I can now get the route and the number of passengers and things like that, okay? So that's that. Um, so on to our next, uh, oh, and now that I actually have these as lines, I can calculate, or no, I can't calculate the distance because again, if I look at my data, I only have one mark for each, for each, uh, 
um, for each route. So what I would need to do is I would need to go back into Alteryx and I would need to bring in another tool called the spatial info tool. And I would need to get the length in, uh, we'll do miles and kilometers because I'm sure some of you like uh, I, some and some like the other. And then now in Tableau, I should be able to just refresh the data source. Hopefully, there it goes. And then uh, I'm going to make these both an average. And I'll put kilometers onto the, uh, maybe onto the tooltip. And now when I hover over, oh, it's not going to tell me because I can't now hover over the map. OK, anyway, so we can see how long each of these routes is. So uh, yeah. OK, anyway, let's move on to the next example. So now we want to look at um, airline routes. And we're going to look at airline routes because in the last example, I showed you how the data had to be tall in order to kind of play connect the dots in Tableau. Um, or, you know, to, to be able to draw. Uh, so if I go back here to the first sheet, I had to have the data tall in order to be able to draw this. If the data is side by side, like an origin and a destination, then I can draw a line in Tableau. So um, I'm going to connect to a new data source. Oops, not stat file, more. And it is my airline routes. And we can see we've got the airline, airline ID. We've got a bunch of stuff here. Um, so this is looking at, so this data set is all of the routes that every airline runs from every airport. So quite a massive data set. Um, what type of plane it is. Come on, why is it not letting me scroll? Okay, because I'm at the end, that's why. Um, okay, whether or not it's a code share. Uh, so actually I'm gonna go ahead and filter out the code shares. So I'm going to exclude the yeses because uh, I don't want to see code shares. Um, zero would mean direct flights, equipment. OK, doesn't really matter. Um, they spelled airport wrong here, so I'm going to fix that because that would really annoy me. But we don't have the latitude and longitude. Um, so let me, I'm going to also hide a couple of fields while I'm here just to kind of clean up the data. And OK, so hide. And now, uh, so instead of this being source airport, I'm going to call this origin airport because that just makes more sense in my head. And I have a second data set here that has the airports. And again, I'm going to go into my join. And we want to say the um, destination airport is equal to the LATA code. And then I also want to say, um, OK, so that's going to give me, actually, let me change this to the origin airport. So this is going to give us the information for the origin. I'm going to bring it, that airport list in again. And this time, I'm going to connect it to the destination. So let to code. OK, there we go. So now on the right-hand side, I've got a bunch of things over here. I can see I have the latitude and longitude, et cetera. So let's go to our sheet now. And you could clean some of these things up. So for example, GPS code, home link, LATA code. There's a lot of things I actually don't need here. Um, so I, I like to go ahead and clean these up while I'm here. Name is the name of the airport. Uh, okay, so I'm going to hide all of those. And then the same fields probably exist here. Oops, let me undo. I didn't mean to hide all of them because I want to keep the country code. Yeah, we'll keep country and region. So let's hide those. And we're just going to keep continent, country, and region. Uh, country, region, and then we're going to hide the rest. OK. And uh, what I'm going to do is this one is my destination. So I'm just going to rename this one as destination, or maybe just DEST. Again, just trying to make sure that I understand what these field names mean, because it gets very confusing to me. This is like watching me, I know. And then down here in the bottom, we've got the number of stops. Now that's not, um, I guess that's something. I'm going to change that to an average. Um, elevation, lat okay, so this latitude and longitude here. So this one, I'm going to rename this as my uh, origin. And this one is going to be my, where's my rename? Origin. And then uh, this one I'm going to rename as destination. 
and this one as destination. Or I could call it destination latitude, destination longitude, it doesn't really matter. And I'm gonna go ahead and create a couple of calculated fields. So I'm gonna create a point for my origin. So I'm gonna use the make point function. Um, so, and that requires two fields to be passed to it. The first one is the, uh, is the, um, uh, the latitude. So I'm gonna do my origin latitude, comma, oops, origin longitude. Oh, I think I made the text a bit too big. There we go. And click on OK. And then I'm going to create another one. That is my destination. And you'll see why I'm actually creating these as separate uh, calculations in a minute. So again, make point. And we want to do destination, latitude, comma, destination, longitude. Okay, so now if I just double click on origin, you'll see I get all of the airports that are in the data set. I only get one mark because I haven't told Tableau how to split the view up yet. So if I wanted to split it up by um, uh, airport, so I could put origin airport on there, and now I have 433 airports in my data set. OK, so now that we have two points, I can create lines. So I'm going to create another field. I'm going to call this my uh, maybe my route. Uh, I'll call it, or maybe I'll call it flight path. And this time I'm gonna use the make line function. Now over here on the right-hand side, um, you can see that it requires a start point and an end point, but both of these have to be points. So what I could have done is I could have said make line and then repeated my make point functions in there again, but I don't, I don't tend to do that because I might need to use these fields again later. So I'm just gonna put origin in there and then destination. So again, I could have rewritten these, make point, latitude, longitude, make point, latitude, longitude. But I know I'm going to reuse these fields multiple times, so I don't want to have to write the calculations out multiple times. OK, so now we have that. I can double click on my flight path. And I see, so let me make this really small. And I can see all of the flight paths around the world. Maybe I'll shrink down the opacity, something like that. Um, but again, it's only one mark. So I need to tell Tableau how to split up that view. And we want to split it up by the route. So, But the route field we don't have. We have an origin airport, and we have a destination airport. But we don't have a route. So we're going to build that. So let's create another calculated field. I'm going to call this one route. And it's just simply going to be the origin airport plus, and then a hyphen, plus the destination airport. So really simple. And let's drag that to the detail shelf and let's see how many marks we get now. So we get 14,710 marks in the view. Okay. So now if I wanted to look at, now I could create these calculations, the origin and destination calculations, because my data was next to each other. So if I go in and look at the data again, and if I scroll to the, to the right here a bit, maybe if it lets me. You'll see that I have my um, I have my latitude and longitude or sorry my origin fields. Come on, why is it not scrolling? This is annoying. I have these fields here for my origin, and then I have these fields here for my destination. So that gives me this origin point, and then there's a destination one somewhere, but they're next to each other, which is why I can build a line in Tableau. So uh, let's say we want to look at all flights for British Airways. And we can now see all the places that it flies to. Um, and now that we have these lines, I can use the distance function in Tableau. So I'm going to create another calculated field. And I'm just going to call it distance. And there's a function called distance. And again, this one requires you to make two points. I don't want to have to retype those calculations. So that's why I created origin and destination. Another good reason to do that is because you might make a mistake in one of the calculations. Uh, if your origin calculation is wrong, you have to fix it in one place. If you do it as a make point and repeat that over and over again, you might have multiple places where you have to fix that. And then the units, uh, let's do kilometers and hit OK. I'm doing kilometers just to annoy the Americans. And I'm going to set the default property to average. And then let's put the distance on to, uh, it doesn't really matter. Let's just stick it on, I don't know, detail. And now when we hover over, we can see the distance in each of these flights. So 
London to Narita is uh, 9,615 uh, kilometers and HND, I don't know what HND airport is. Okay, so what we could do is we could put origin airport onto the tooltip. And then I can see the origin air. Oh, it just tells me HND. That's not very helpful, is it? Um, I thought I had a name field somewhere. Oh well, I think I I think I deleted it by accident. Uh, show hidden fields. Uh, name, yeah, unhide. Okay, so I want to put name on here instead. Maybe not. There we go. So now I can see it's, oh, so this is, that's my, oh, you know what it's doing? It's doing the, it's doing it in both directions because the flight does go both ways. So that makes sense. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, so that's how you do make lines in, in Tableau for airline routes. Um, we could then also maybe filter down to, uh, let's, let's maybe change it to, I think Delta is the largest in the world. So um, let's do DL. And you'll see there's flights everywhere. This is kind of crazy. And let's say that we want to look at just those that are that originate in the US. And now we can see all of the flights that originate from the US. And maybe we want to look at the origin airport of um, Atlanta. Hometown. And now we can see all of the all of the places that Delta flies directly out of Atlanta. So Atlanta to Narita is eleven thousand uh, kilometers, which is what about uh, six thousand miles, something like that, eight thousand miles. Um, yeah. Okay. So that is uh, airline routes. And does anybody have any questions along the way? Uh, if you could just stop me, if if we do, I'm going to actually skip the storm paths for now and switch over to the rats data so that we can, um, so I don't take up too much time. So, and hopefully I put that data here, uh, rat settings, there we go. So the uh, first thing I always do is rename my data source. And now I wait for Tableau to play catch up. It's not that big of a file either. So I don't know why this always takes so long. Come on. Okay, let's just go in here. We need to change the data type for, oh my God, this is annoying. Okay, so now it's frozen. Hopefully if somebody from Tableau is watching and you can point out how terrible it is in these cases. Maybe I shouldn't be disparaging it, but it's true. Great, so now I'm going to have to, oh, there it goes finally. Um, so I wanna change this to, actually, I'm going to create an extract first. And that way, rent sightings, hopefully, it runs faster. Come on. And now, of course, it has to go through and do all that again. Uh, do you have a joke, Andy? I was just thinking somebody must know a joke. I heard a really good one the other day, too. I mean, it was really good, but it was really awful, like so bad. Um, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. And this is done, so I don't have to now. Um, so my created date field, that's gonna be a date. I don't know if I'm gonna need that or not. <clears throat> but again, I have my latitude and longitude fields. And what I wanna do is um, I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm gonna, and it's gonna be latitude comma longitude. Okay, and now if I double click on that, I can see every um, every rat sighting in New York. Okay, again, it's just one mark right now. Um, if I wanna make this 
so for example, I could put maybe the unique key, which is each individual record. Let me change this first to be a circle. And I'm going to put unique key onto detail at all. And let's see how long it takes Tableau to draw 180,000 marks. This is probably a very bad idea. I wonder how it decides when to use this, the, uh, the rainbow spinner on a Mac versus the poison sign. So everybody knows that, that'd be good to know. I'm gonna filter the data in a second. Come on. Okay, let me just, um, maybe I'll just look at data for 2022. Come on. I am checking the boxes. We have to learn to be patient and deep. <laughs> so well, yoga. We, shouldn't, we shouldn't have to be. We shouldn't have to be patient. That's no, the problem. <laughs> but everyone because we're trying to do, we're trying to get into the flow of analysis in our analytics Tableau user group, and we're doing neither right now <laughs> because we're waiting for Tableau. I know, but people are enjoying your presentation. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's hit OK. Hit OK again. Hope that should reduce the number. Okay. So we're down to eight hundred and twenty-two marks. And of course, it's still going to take forever even to draw just 800 marks. I don't know if it's done or not. OK, so that's just, this is just kind of like a circle map. So I, OK, I think we're going to need more data than that. So let me uh, edit my data source filters. Let me just bring in maybe um, maybe five years worth of data. Let's see if that's better. OK, so now we got 75,000 marks. OK, so I'm going to go here and maybe reduce the opacity once it's, once it's done having a heart attack. OK, there we go. So I'm going to, oh my god. My patience wears very thin when this kind of stuff happens. Well, at least we know it's live. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's an extract. So, uh, it, or is that, or do you mean? Well, the demo is live, live but the, the data is live. extract. Yeah, yeah it's, it's inevitably going to happen in a live demo more than, um, anyway. So, so the kind of regular dot map actually doesn't work very well here. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to a uh, density map. And we can get, this is, you know, kind of a traditional sort of heat map. So I'm going to switch my opacity. I'm going to put that all the way up. Um, and then I'm going to choose a different color palette. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to use my favorite color palette called Calshit. Um, and we can increase the intensity. So you can kind of, you, you can sort of make this look what, however you want based on, you know, how you adjust the sizes and all that. But we can see around, um, around Central Park, there's a lot of rat sightings, but somehow there's none like directly in Central Park. I don't quite understand that. Okay, so so that's one thing we can do. Now I wanna create, um, uh, next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create what are kind of like uh, uh, a way to like round the data. So I wanna, I wanna aggregate the marks. Uh, I wanna aggregate marks that are near each other. So I'm gonna start with calling this um, Let's see, let's call this our, um, we'll do it this way. We'll do a rounded point. And I'm gonna do make point again. And this time I'm going to round the latitude. And let's say we do it to, let's say, uh, let's say zero decimal places to start. And then round the longitude to zero decimal places. Okay, and let's see what that looks like. So you see, we only get two dots because I rounded to, uh, to zero. So let me edit this now. And this is when I would start making the windows a bit smaller so I can see what it's doing in the background. So if I make it one decimal, so remember, uh, latitude and longitude are really precise. So let's see what happens as we add more marks. Okay, so starting to look a bit better. So let's make it two. This is where a parameter would have been a good idea. And that looks pretty cool. Uh, maybe we make it three.
So let's look at that. And now it's kind of, right, this doesn't look as good now. So I'm going to go back and make a two. And um, if I put something on size, let's say we put the, um, the rat count onto uh, size. Everything's going to be given the same size because we haven't told Tableau how to split up the view yet. So um, yeah, so this is this is a bit of a, a bit of a problem here. So um, what I need to do, I think this will work. No, is this going to work? Um, how did I do this before? Oh, I know what I need to do. Okay, so I messed up. So I'm going to create another calculator field. I'm going to call this one round lat. And I think we said it was two decimal places. Yep, two was the right one. And then create another calculator field. Let's call this one round long. And round longitudes to two decimal places. And uh, now I'm going to make round latitude a uh, latitude, round longitude a longitude. And I want to make those actually dimensions because I want Tableau to split up the view based on all possible combinations of those. Okay, so now I have 812 marks, which looks a lot better. And if I put my rat sighting count onto size, we can get a better idea. This is kind of, you know, it sort of looks like a heat map, I guess. Um, what I would probably do is maybe put a border on um, and reduce the opacity so we can sort of see through the circles a bit and maybe increase the size so we can see them overlap, something like that. Now, the problem is when we made it three decimal places, it made it too granular. When we made it one decimal place, we made it, it made it too spread out. So we're kind of stuck with making two decimal places, or we could create hex bins. So if you haven't used hex bin maps before, they're really cool. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a parameter, and I'm going to call this my hex bin adjuster. And I'm just going to leave it as a floating point. doesn't really matter. And then I'm going to show that parameter. So now I'm going to create a new calculated field. Let me show the calculations here. So I'll call this one hex uh, x. And if I look in my functions here, so hex bin x, what it does is it maps an xy coordinate. So for us, that's a rat sighting um, to the x coordinate of the nearest hexagonal bin. Basically, it's trying to take things that are close together and group them together. That's the easiest way to think about it. So we're going to do hex bin x, but the coordinates have to be x comma y. Well, x in a map is longitude comma latitude, right? So that gives us something like that. But in order to, um, well, I'll just do it like this for now. And this one uh, is, this is going, oh, let me just create another one now. So hex y. And uh, this one's going to be hex bin y in this case. And longitude comma latitude. So the setup is the same. Okay. So again, I want to make both of these dimensions. And I want them both to be continuous so that I get an axis. The x field, that's going to be a longitude because we're going across the x axis. And then the y, we want to make a latitude. So x and y, and we get a single mark, right? OK, so not particularly useful. We want to split this up a bit more. And that's where the adjuster comes into play. So let me edit this calculation now. And what I want to do is I want to take my longitude and multiply it by my adjuster. And then I'm going to take my latitude and multiply it by my adjuster. Hit OK. And do the same thing here. So times adjuster. And then times adjuster. And now this hex bin adjuster allows me to sort of control the density in the map. So if I make it 30, you'll see I get some more things. But what's happening now? is if I, uh, we don't have a map in the background anymore, because if I hover over one of these marks, you'll see that my hex x is, what, minus 2,000. So there's no such thing as a minus 2,000 longitude. It doesn't make any sense at all. So what we have to do is we've now scaled them up based on the hex bin, and then we need to scale them back down to make them a latitude or a longitude. So I'm going to take that whole result and divide it by the adjuster. The same thing for the y. So divide it by the adjuster. Now we should see everything back on a map again. So I, I can control much better the granularity of the number of dots. So 
if you remember the rounded example, if we had zero or one, they were too spread out. If you had two, it looked good, but you go to three and um, you know, you're kind of, you're way too dense then. So I can make this 200 and everything gets laid out into a nice little grid. So I could even do that and then maybe shrink the size, something like that, right? So you get these really, really pretty looking examples that you can use. So let's go with something like, let's see what a hundred looks like. Okay, let's do that. And I'm gonna make it a bit bigger so they can kind of fit together nice and neat. All right, so that's how you would create a hex bin map. Um, and if I put the count onto size, we'll see something relatively similar to our previous example, right? So, we're, so we know we're doing something kind of similar, but if I make this 200, I can now get that granularity. Um, if I reduce the opacity, we, can, we have even more granularity than we did in the other map. So, so there's trade-offs on which, which way you want to do it. Okay, so let me go back. What I wanna do now, and maybe I'll wrap up after this, is I wanna create, uh, I basically want, um, I want, let's pretend that you have a pet cat and you want to know where should you put your pet cat to feed it rats? Because your cat, it loves rats plenty. It loves those as snacks. Um, doesn't like chasing them away. It likes capturing them and eating them. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these circles and we're going to turn it into a cat symbol. So to do that, we're going to create a calculated field. And I'm going to call this uh, cat emotions. And this is where we're going to use a function called uh, so let me go to my table calcs. We're going to use one called window percentile. So this tells me what percentile is each dot within the whole view. So window percentile, and I want to do my um, I want to do my rat settings count, but I can't bring that. Oh, can I? Oh yeah, that'll work. Okay. And then I I want to say is it? Uh, let's see. So that's going to give me the percentile. So I want to say if that percentile is greater than uh, or equal to 0.75. So meaning it's there's a lot of rats there. Let's say that they're happy. Now I'm just gonna copy this and paste it. Let me just make this window a bit bigger. So now I'm gonna say else if it's maybe greater than 50%, then they are uh, satisfied. Okay, copy, paste. Uh, and now if it's greater than or go to 0.25, it's like uh, they're pissed off. And then otherwise they're angry. As you know, cats are generally just angry anyway. Um, okay, so what am I doing here? Uh, we call it integer, you mean float. Oh, what am I doing here? I think I'm using the wrong function, window percentile. Uh, expression and then number. Um, Oh, oh, okay, I know what I'm doing. So I wanna say if the count of rat sightings, this wrong, is greater than or equal to this, and now I say comma 0.75. I'm happy, okay, so that should be better. Oh, shoot. Oh, that's so annoying. What the hell happened? There we go. So I just called the function the wrong way. So let's make this 1.5, oops. And then make this one paste 0.25. Okay, so that should get rid of the error. Okay, good. And we wanna drag that to, let's put it on, let's put it on our color shelf for now. And we wanna compute using um, every single cell. Okay, so now we get four colors. We got the angry, the happy, the pissed off, and the satisfied. So I'm gonna reorder these, happy, satisfied, pissed off, and angry. So the happiest cats are gonna be in these locations. Okay, great. So what I wanna do though, is I'm gonna move this, I'm gonna change my mark type to a shape, and I'm gonna move my cat emotions to the shape shelf. And now you see we get four different shapes. And if I edit my shape shelf, I'm gonna go in here to a color palette, or a, sorry, a shape palette I have called cats. So happy cats are gonna have hard eyes. Satisfied cats are gonna be maybe smiling. The pissed off cats are gonna have the little snarl and the angry cats are gonna have 
the you know everybody's probably seen that before and there we go we now have our cat map uh, so if we want to see where the happy cats are oh i need to turn on my highlighter come on there we go we can see the happy cats the satisfied etc so now if i adjust my hex bins let's say i make it 50 because my cats um, they like covering a lot of territory uh, we can now see a bit better where the happy cats are, satisfied, et cetera. So just something a bit fun. We could also, let me just show you something different while we're here. Um, so I could instead make this, um, okay, let me do it this way. Let's make this a circle and let's set the background to uh, yellow. And then I'm gonna uh, make this, uh, yep. So I'm gonna duplicate one of these and make it a dual axis. And now on the second one, I wanna make this one a shape. And I'm gonna put my cat emotions on shape again. Okay, so it so it duplicated that. So let me just uh, duplicate, let me just put the new one on here. And um, oops, I did something wrong there. Okay, so what I'm gonna do this time is I'm going to use another palette I have called, uh, where is it, emoticons. So happy, uh, so that. So if you ever wanna make an emoji map, that's how you would do an emoji map. So we've got an emoji map, a cat map, etc. cetera. So I will, I will stop there because I'm sure I've taken up too much time. Um, I don't know how to get back to not share my screen. Um, how do I stop sharing my screen? I think like at the bottom, it looks, there should be like a... Oh, uh, here we go. Stop yeah. sharing. Okay, so I could go on and on and on. I, I really like like working with it. Hopefully you like the cats and the, and the, and the emojis. That's, that's the best part. That's why I save it for the end. Awesome. Thanks so much, Andy. That was an amazing talk. Hopefully everyone learned something. I'm just gonna quickly check into the Q&A to see if there's anything that we need to get answered here. Once I can find the chat, oh, there it is. So let's see here. Okay, so Andy, someone wants to know those steps that you took at the beginning with Alteryx, can we do those with Tableau Prep? No. No. Okay. Simple Tableau answer. Prep there. Do, Tableau Prep can't create lines or things like that. Thank it you. Can, so it, can do, it can do the like create points. Like it can it can create geographic points, but it can't create lines. Awesome. Thank you. So there we have the answer. Unfortunately, Tableau Prep, you know, can't do that. But um, I think most of us, I think I, I think a lot of people have access to Alteryx, so hopefully that's fair. Um, what else do we have? If I could plug one thing while you're doing that, this is something I've been working on for about six months from now. I'm actually going to start like a membership program where I'm going to put out like content just for people that are members. So if people could keep an eye out for that. Um, you know, I've, been, I've got all this content I've done over the years that I want to share with people but I want to make it more membership based instead. So um, keep an eye out on Twitter and, and LinkedIn for, for that. That should be awesome. Thank you. Okay, so one more here is, is there a way to scale the hex bin adjuster and the size of the symbol based on the scale of the map? Um, let me share my screen again. I think I understand what they're saying. So, if I adjust the scale of my map, so in other words, if I zoom out, uh, yeah, the things do, they don't adjust together. If that's the answer, if that's the question you're trying to ask, yeah. So Tableau doesn't support that. Okay, understood. Wouldn't that so be I great? Guess that's two no's now in the question, so it doesn't. <laughs> okay, maybe there is one more, which I'm actually also really interested in this. Okay. Um, someone is asking, is there a public version of Alteryx, like Tableau no. Public? No. no. Ah, okay. Three no's. Yeah. This is getting Three good. Three <laughs> no's. Well, hey, I think that, you know, what you've done for the community more than makes up for any of this stuff. So, you know, I think <laughs> we'll <get it. laughs> 
So thank you, anyone. Please, if you have questions for Andy, um, please feel free to reach out to him after. We're going to just keep on moving now. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Adam. And sorry, I need to find my screen here. OK, there we go. So next we have Adam, who, again, another familiar face in the community. He's a Tableau visionary and ambassador, and he currently works as the principal for data visualization and enablement at Moderna, where he's the technical lead of their Tableau practice. Um, as far as his Tableau journey, Adam has spent about a, a decade working with Tableau, um, but most of that time he wasn't active in the community, but now he's joined the data farm, he's fully invested, and he's found a passion for design and accessibility, as you know, we've kind of seen some of that. And a fun fact about Adam is that he discovered he was distantly related to the infamous Lizzie Borden while he was investigating his ancestry. And Adam is going to present on us today data visualization best practices for business applications, the five basics. And so we look forward to that. So I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to you now, Adam. Uh, thank you. Um, one second. Let me pull up my slides. Selecting an entire screen. Yeah, this um, window sharing is a little bit unique with uh, Bevy, as um, we've experienced, Andy. So I assume you can see my screen now, correct? Looks great. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, I'm Adam Miko, as mentioned, the principal of data visualization and enablement at Moderna. I've been there a little bit over a year. And this is um, something I've kind of studied over the course, not knowing I was studying it, um, but some stuff that I brought home with me that I found very important. And these are the data visualization best practices for business application, the five basics. So you um, obviously know about Andy, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So as mentioned before, I'm a Tableau visionary and ambassador. I'm part of the Data Leadership Collaborative as an advisory board member. And prior to working at Moderna, I was a Tableau evangelist at Curis US, which is a global data consultancy and a public sector senior data analyst and business automation specialist. And I worked in the public sector 22 plus years before joining Curis. Um, so I stayed at one place a very long time, but the journey um, basically because of the data fam and uh, finding great resources like Andy's tools and so many others really helped me grow um, as a data visualizer, as well as understanding more about what is accessible and what works with um, engaging audiences. So a little bit more about me on the personal side. I'm a husband, father, grandfather. Um, my granddaughter was born on February 22nd, 2022. So yeah, that dates me. I'm a little bit older than some people, but um, I feel good about being a grandfather to a lovely um, granddaughter. And I'm also a dog father. I love to travel. I'm a foodie and you could probably tell if you see me in person, I do like a bit of food. Um, I happen to be autistic and I'm a published author. I recently published a book on uh, Tableau uh, Desktop Specialist Certification for PAC Publishing. And that QR code should relate you to that um, place in, in Amazon.com. So next up, and here's just kind of what we're going to be going over today. So learning and managing the business use case, because it's often um, not understood by a lot of practitioners. Um, they don't, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Finding the right charts for data visualization. And an example from Andy will obviously come up from this, as many of you know of his work in this regard. Um, understanding pre-attentive attributes, modern design techniques, and accessibility, which I would consider a secret sauce. So learning the business use case. So my Tableau journey started, I was an unemployment insurance law trainer. So absolutely nothing to do with data visualization, except I used to be what was called the really good Excel guy in the office, but then they had this new tool uh, called Tableau. And it was demonstrated to me at a leadership conference. And I was the only one really curious about it and asking all the questions. And like, Adam, you can go ahead and take it. So fortunately, I was able to play around with it. But it was kind of playing around in the dark. Um, back then, I think I was on version 4. 
Um, we should have had 7.2 when I started, but I think we're at version four because of course I work with the state of, with the public sector. So they're a little bit slow on that. Um, so one thing I learned as being a subject matter expert is that developers really need to um, listen to the business. They need to ask questions and relevant questions, really understand the requirements that the business is pro providing. Um, working with a lot of developers as a subject matter expert, I knew there was a big knowledge gap between the two. And the more time you could spend asking the right questions and really understanding their requirements and understanding their data will really help uh, you out as a developer and meeting their needs. Next up, you have to understand the scope. So determine data needs. Um, I consider data visualization the very tip of the data, ice, uh, data visualization iceberg. Um, you're usually working with lots of dirty data. You have to clean it. You have to work with data engineering teams sometimes. You have to work with tools like Alteryx and um, uh, Tableau Prep if it's a lighter load and other tools like that. So there's a lot of work involved getting the data in the right shape to um, be um, useful for data visualization. And also you have to think about uh, scope as well. So um, what kind of effort is it gonna be? You have to set um, reasonable expectations uh, for your stakeholders. If they don't have the data and they don't have a reasonable way to put it together in a great way, um, you have to make sure that they have um, they understand what those um, requirements are to get the data in the right shape so you could visualize it. You also have to consider your resources and also work with uh, people that could actually sponsor you and help support the project and engagement. So another part of it is besides setting expectations, you need to verify the business questions. So you may have delivered a dashboard that met the requirements initially, but Oftentimes, a lot of people that you're working with when you're developing and sharing uh, business dashboards, you have no, they have no idea what Tableau can do. So oftentimes it's like, wow, it could do this. What about this? What can it do this? And what can it do in this regard? So more questions come up. So you have to verify those questions and iterate when, when you can. So a lot of people hate developing dashboards and like, you need to make more stuff on this dashboard. You have to, we wanted to do this, this, and that. And if there's a way to do it, you could really do that and, and illustrate the value uh, to your stakeholders. So it's super important that you don't get frustrated if they ask for iterations or questions or additional items on the dashboard. That means they're super interested about the dashboard and they may actually use it. So the other part and the last part is that you have to figure out how it's going to be supported. So if you're working for a consultancy, for example, the support may be very short term. So you may be finished with the project, you may have um, iterated and you shared uh, the result of the data visualization. You may be not sticking around to see engagement and all that stuff. But if you're developing um, for a team and that you're working on a project or with an internal uh, customer and employer for a long time, you wanna set um, ways to uh, look at engagement, see if it's if it's doing its job, look at performance over time, and also look at the underlying data to make sure that it's not impacting the data visualization. So those are things that you should have in mind when you're um, learning and managing the business use case for data visualization. So finding the right chart choice. There are a ton of tools, and this is the biggest headache a lot of developers have. Uh, especially when you're starting out with Tableau or any data visualization tool. It's like, what, what do I do as far as uh, creating charts for the, a certain case? So there's a, a couple examples that come to mind and I'll share a couple of them. Tableau has one, I'll be perfectly honest, it's not the greatest, but it's something and it's part of Tableau and it's related to that. So you kind of look at that and dig into that a little bit more. Another good example, is the Chartio one. It, pro it provides more details as far as charts, adds additional context, and it's one scrollable page. But obviously, if you're working with Tableau, you wanna work with something on um, Tableau Public, work with the data visualization you could utilize. I believe this visualization by our own Andy Kreeble has millions of views, and it's super helpful, and it's built right in Tableau. So you have everything at your absolute fingertips, and it's so wonderful to work with. It's something that you should use, but please don't claim it as your own. 
So um, those are some tools that you could utilize, and I will share those links in the chat after this presentation. So let me go back. Next up, we have pre-attentive attributes. So one of the main questions um, when I'm hiring or interviewing a data visualization people is um, what are data uh, pre-attentive attributes and how they apply to data visualization? About 80% have no idea what I'm talking about, which is pretty scary. Um, but the ones that do, I really understand that they're really looking and appreciating um, the science of data visualization. Um, and basically, it's what people's eyes are drawn to um, when you're looking at various elements of a, a data visualization. I do like this ta uh, Tableau um, help guide on this. So you should certainly check this out. It gives you um, a number of different things that you can look at and apply for your data visualizations to utilize uh, pre-attentive attributes. Um, very common ones would be size, shape, as Andy pointed out, and size. Um, color hue is another one, and length is another one. Um, but there's a lot more to this article, and there's plenty of articles out there on that. So I very advise you strongly to research and investigate pre-attentive attributes and look at your own visualizations to see how you're effectively applying those attributes and um, making sure your, your stakeholders are seeing what they really need to see and what's important to them. So modern design techniques. When I started with the Tableau community, my design was um, really awful. And I learned a lot about that. I was more of an analytics guy. Nobody really questioned me on my design when I was working um, in it with a company that didn't have a very strong data visualization background. So I was kind of, um, I was, um, I thought what I was doing was really good until I saw what people were doing in public. The only time I would um, engage with community is when I'm looking up um, Andy's videos or uh, Tableau Public to see how I could do one thing or another, but I didn't really consider or care about design at all. Um, but it really helped me a lot seeing what people could do and the impact of really good design has with uh, data visualization. So I wrote an article about two years ago uh, regarding um, my journey with infographics and business dashboards and how I kind of married the two to help me um, uh, create more effective data visualizations. And I could show you a quick example of my first Tableau public visualization. I thought it was really good when it was created, but you'll see it's an it's a really it's an eyesore. I was actually using story points, which was pretty funny. Um, I, I haven't probably used them since then, and word clouds I probably haven't used since then. And this color gradient, and the size of the visualizations, these tables. This is um, this was what I considered great work at the time. It was fun analytically trying to devise a, a scale to determine what songs and artists were doing really good at certain years or points in time, but I don't wanna look at this ever again. And I'm just sharing this now. This is probably the last time I'll do this presentation. So this is the last time I hope to ever see this data visualization. But a couple of years later, um, when I started, um, when I really practiced and worked hard on design and so forth, I made something a lot cleaner. Um, and this was when I was working with Curis, my job before, um, working with uh, uh, Moderna. So uh, this was the first partner, um, Tableau partner visualization of the day in like um, maybe a year or over a year. And I was super proud of this because it's very simple, but there's a lot of things underlying here. And it's an, actually an accelerator now. So a lot of different things that work together. And of course it's slower now because I'm on Bevy, but <laughs> normally it works pretty smoothly and, and nicely and everything's at your fingertips. There are a lot of different things that you could access and work with um, with this chart, but it seems like a very simple chart when you're working with it initially. So it was one of those things I was super uh, proud of and it was great to be able to work with an employer that I could um, utilize and work with data and provide use cases to share with customers. Um, so that was um, super fun for me. And uh, that was my second uh, global visualization of the day. And this was back in September of 2021. And uh, it's done pretty well since then. I was kind of surprised because it looks like a very simple chart, 
but it was an example of me mirroring uh, modern design techniques, utilizing white space, um, creating um, additional items that apply better uh, best practices and so forth. And it's not such an eyesore as that chart that, you, that I don't wanna look at again, but I'll show you one more time. So a, a big part of that is utilizing all the tools. Oh, I gotta turn this off. I can't look at this anymore. Um, so utilizing all the tools of um, what the community offers. So one thing I'll point out with modern design techniques, if you're working in a work silo and you're um, not really looking at what else is out there and not looking at data visualization or um, Tableau public and seeing what the greatest are doing and learning from them, you're going to be continuing to do stuff like this. I know I would still be if I, if it wasn't part of being really vested in our community and really wanting to learn um, how to design a lot better than um, this. Although Janet Jackson would probably be very happy that she was really on the top of this page. So, um, so that's a case in point as far as utilizing modern design techniques to make sure, hey, I want to do something with best practices. I want to share something that will work with other people um, and that people would actually want to go back to and engage with. I don't know anybody that would want to engage with this more than once or even once, um, but this is a lot more fun and people will be more engaged working with something a lot smoother, a lot uh, better analytics, as well as um, more details that doesn't look so intimidating up front. But as you dig deeper and deeper, there's a lot of um, information that you can gather that could be helpful, not only for um, executive stakeholders, but also analysts. So that's kind of what um, I was uh, appreciating um, there, but that's only due to my work with the community. If it wasn't for the community and seeing what was outside of my work silo, um, that wouldn't have been possible for me. So if you are not really happy about your design right now, um, be patient with it because if you work, study and practice, you'll get much better. And the secret sauce is accessibility. So accessibility is limiting the obstacles to engagement. So learning how to design accessibility applies uh, the previous points, but also considers ways that you could enable as many as possible. So what's the best way to get your visualization um, supported by so many other people? It's um, if they could actually use it. So you have to consider many different elements uh, for accessibility. And one article that I really enjoy regarding accessibility is, let me pull this up, is this one. So 10 guidelines for data viz accessibility. Um, and it brings up, a lot of different attributes that you can look at. I'm not going to go over it all right now, but it's really good ways to help you become a better designer really a, a quicker, a quickly and more effectively. And the other one I'll point out is um, Emily Kuhn. Uh, she's done this talk a number of times, but it's uh, accessibility and data visualization. Uh, it's a really impactful discussion. It gets um, personal. And it really has a, a major impact on why accessibility is important in data visualization. So I strongly encourage you to look that up or look up any of her talks on accessibility and really feel empowered by uh, what it can do and what you can do with accessibility and how much impact it does have. And um, I'm gonna keep it short because I wanna make sure Maxine has enough time to do his data visualization, but I'll end with a couple things here real quick. So if you're going to Tableau Conference and this person may look a bit familiar. So this is when we were drafting our initial uh, talk for the Tableau Conference. So um, she runs a data, she's a technical lead of a data COE in um, Switzerland um, running a server uh, outfit and I'm the technical lead of a Tableau Cloud outfit. So we're gonna have a, a friendly or maybe not so friendly battle at Tableau Conference. So if you um, check out this QR code, you could access that uh, particular, uh, uh, particular uh, uh, breakout session and, uh, and put it on your favorites and uh, put it on your agenda. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna be giving out a lot of swag t-shirts, stickers. I may get stickers on my head at some point, who knows? Um, maybe you'll have a selfie or two. 
Um, and I'll give away a couple copies of my uh, book as well. And finally, if you wanna find me, um, I think this goes in my LinkedIn. I'm not sure, I just put the QR code together. <laughs> so I'm assuming this goes to my LinkedIn. Um, go ahead and, and connect with me on LinkedIn. I just hope you're not trying to sell me anything. A lot of people are trying to do that these days. Please don't try to sell me anything. Connect if you wanna network, uh, but <laughs> please don't try to sell me anything on LinkedIn. Um, thank you so much. And it was really, I was really happy to be part of this. And finally, this presentation is retired. Thanks everyone. And now I'm very worried, Adam, because now that I know who you are related to, maybe I will be very nice with you on the battle. <laughs> Did you just um, research people. that? Please come a lot of people so you can protect me from Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be protected from you, Annabelle. I, you're the one that I'm worried about. <laughs> I put you in a, yeah, between you and Lizzie Borden, I think I'd, I'd be more worried about Annabelle. I'm kidding. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Adam. Great talk on two um, definite things to consider when we are trying to, you know, get people to really connect with the insights. They need to, you know, best practices, pretensive attributes, all of that gets people to see what we want them to see. And of course, we need to consider the accessibility stuff. So thanks so much, Adam, for this um, talk. It's been helpful. I think we do have one or two questions here. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah. So someone is asking for those links that you share. So I think after the call, we will probably connect with you to grab those and share with the community. Um, I'm going to uh, drop them in chat, um, Chimdi. Perfect. I'm gonna, I have them all in a notepad already, and I'll just pop them in the chat. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Adam. And then the second one coming from Sarah, any top suggestions on managing or approaching accessibility best practices that oppose the client's priorities and database? So I think what she's asking is basically any suggestions for how to approach accessibility when it goes against what the user, the client is asking for, basically. Right. So sometimes you have to, it depends on your client but some clients are open to suggestion. Many clients don't know what best practices are. Some clients want a, a 40 slice pie chart with every color under the sun. Um, th you have to show them, the best way to com uh, combat that is show them an example of what they want to have realized and show an example that gives an option to that client. It does take extra work, but it will be a dashboard that people will use as opposed to a dashboard that the client wants and nobody will actually look at or want to go to. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. And yeah, I think that just to add to that, one thing that I recently experienced is we had a client, you know, similar situation and, you know, our, our leader kind of made it clear, like we're not order takers, right? Like you're not just there to do everything. Sometimes you have to communicate and share your thoughts and experience so that they too can understand like there's other ways. So I think that's a good, a good suggestion. So just to keep it moving, um, any more questions? One more, and then we'll move on to Maxime. So any suggestions on how to create dashboard templates to keep consistent design across organization projects? So yes, I think it's, Annabelle and I may talk about this during our chat. So one of the things that you'll want to work with with your company, if you have the bandwidth and the resources, or maybe take extra time to do, is work on creating a style guide, including um, templates in association with that style guide to help users not only understand um, what are best practices according to your business or your business model, but you also wanna make sure you have something that they can work with. So the onboarding of um, that work is not as uh, complex as it would be without it. As um, many people are utilizing, uh, um, working with dashboards and new to Tableau, the most troublesome part for a lot of people is um, getting off of sheets and putting those sheets on the dashboards when they're working with layouts and so forth. So reducing some of that viscosity helps your um, creators um, much quicker and gives them the ability to feel a little bit more comfortable. And then they could start creating their own visualizations with an understanding of what it takes to design a, a nice, uh, have a nice template to display your data visualizations in a good manner. 
Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Hopefully that's been helpful. And what I suggest, if you don't mind, just so we can move on, Adam, maybe if you can pop into the Q&A and, you know, if people want to interact, maybe you can help answer them. That would be of fantastic. Course. Thank you. And next, we're going to move Hi. on to our, thank you. And next, we're going to move on to our last but not least speaker. So I'm going to share my screen once more. Adam, do you mind? Um, stop sharing, please. Thank you. Okay. So... All right, so finally today, we have Maxime here with us. Um, and Maxime has been working as an analytics consultant since 2016, so very experienced there. And he helps companies adopt analytics tools by providing training and coaching sessions and also um, building dashboards for them. As far as his, oops, sorry. As far as his journey, um, he has a passion for problem solving and he likes building custom visuals with Tableau and calculations, and he's always trying to find, you know, the easiest solution for that. He recently contributed to starting the French Tug recently. Um, and outside of work, Maxime spends his time playing guitar, singing, baking cakes, running, traveling around, trying to find the perfect surf spot in the summer, and snowboarding in the winter. So I guess, you know, Maxime is really, really active. Um, and today he's going to be talking to us about um, custom visuals with calculations. And I think this is something that we're all really interested in it because of course, you know, we all like to go beyond show me. And so hopefully Maxime can really give us some tips to get those custom visuals going based on the calculation logic. So over to you, Maxime, um, I'll, I'll stop sharing now. And you can take us away. Thanks a lot. And take your time, Maxime. We recall. Sorry? Take your time, please. Don't hurt. Okay, yeah. I yeah, you know me, I tend to speak quite fast. Uh, okay, all right, so I'll share my screen if you can just confirm that you see it. Uh, so this is me from a long time ago. Um, thanks for the introduction. Introduction. Uh, yeah, I'll take my time, try not to speak too much, but I, I'm i always quite ambitious when I put together a presentation, especially with, with those topics where there are quite a lot of things to say. Um, so yeah, today I'm, I'm gonna try to provide you an overview of the different toolboxes, techniques, and reflexes that you should think about when you want to create a custom visual in Tableau. Basically, anytime you want to go, as you, as uh, Chimney said, be on the show me, create something which is custom, just twist a standard chart into something else, maybe better, hopefully. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to, uh, I will try to show you some of those techniques I, uh, I tend to use. So uh, maybe starting first with um, the thing I always try to use first. Um, it's something actually which is not really related to Tableau. It's quite universal. Uh, mm -hmm. It's always about building IDs. Um, I'm going to show you a customer use case I faced not too long ago. Um, and so basically they had some data that looked like that. They had basically three years and they wanted to compare the same month of April, but the three years together, right? They kind of know their way around Tableau. We've done some coaching some, some, since some time now. And basically what they did is that they wanted to have those three years overlap. And in order to do that, they created something like this. So they created, I will assume that uh, you heard about the LDs before um, they, uh, and the date calculations, but they basically created something like this. What did they do? They just took every single date they had inside their, their data and they just shifted it into the last year, the current one that we know, right? 2023 here. This worked pretty well. What they did with that is that they just created a new date field, which is kind of fake, but can be used then to assemble all the years together and to have them overlap, right? Because if we wouldn't use that, well, and if we would try to have those different years overlap, we would remove this, but we have a continuous axis and somehow it doesn't work well, right? So they did this and they ended up with such a chart. Now, the issue came with the fact that their data is highly seasonal, right? They have one day during the week where they have such a huge sales compared to the rest. So they cannot really compare um, doing that because they would end up and we put it together into a table with their calculation, they would compare all the 4th of April, for example, but they would end up comparing here a, th a Saturday with a Sunday, with a Monday, and it does not really make sense uh, for them. So how did we solve that? Well, it all comes, and especially when you work with dates, it all comes with defining a proper ID and then 
most of the time using either a table calculation or fixed calculation. In my case, I went for uh, fixed calculation and I built something like that. So basically, what you got to understand is what is the key that you can define for you in order to put all the dates that you want to compare together together, right? In our case, we wanted to compare for the same week and the same weekday of that week, all the different years, right? So we created something I would call an identifier, right? One ID that is based on three digits. The two first digits would be the number of the week, so from 0, 01 to 53, and the last digit would be the weekday from one to seven. Having this kind of unique ID helps me then to calculate something which would be then the maximum date and helps me go from something like this to something like that. And I still create a fake date, right? But I'm now using a, a more, let's say, useful ID. I'm creating still a, a fake date, but I'm aligning all the weekdays together, right? All the Sundays, the Thursday, the weekday, the Wednesday, etc. So how did how did it look like? Well, once we replaced the data, we ended up with something which is way more suitable in order to compare the dates together, right? We aligned all the weekdays from all the weeks together based on the maximum dates that appeared inside the data. If we try to summarize it up, we went from this to this to that. Now, building IDs is the first thing I think about when I need to create a custom chart, and especially if I need to work with some date calculations, because that's somehow the um, my main go-to and then and the main solution I find. But I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna say something uh, against what you said, Andy. I do like the relationship model, uh, especially when it comes to create custom charts. Um, the relationship model is something that allows you to kind of go beyond what you can do with the standard uh, functions in Tableau. And what I do like uh, with this model is that it allows you to, um, let's say, join your data with different IDs without um, duplicating your data and preserving the integrity of the different KPIs you're joining your data with. So in order to just demonstrate uh, what I do with that and what we did, this is also a customer use case I faced. Um, one of my customers actually built a dashboard, which was quite fine ma finely made. They just had an issue with this uh, table because they wanted to display their turnover, turnover growth and they wanted to have something maybe more visual uh, or visually appealing than what they had, right? They had this uh, small table of numbers and what they wanted at the end was to actually turn this into a bridge chart, something like this that you can see here, which I think we will all agree is a bit more appealing. Now, what is the issue if you want to build this? Well, if you want to build this bridge chart, you will face two issues. First one, you need to work with measure values. And uh, as we all know, uh, you cannot use any table calculations uh, on the measure values. And therefore, if you want to actually have a running total in order to follow any waterfall or bridge chart tutorial online, you will need to have a running total, so a table calculations, which you can't use with the measure values. The second issue we have here is that even if we were able to split the data onto um, some dimension members, we would face one um, problem, which is that the fact that the same data here is used at, on different areas, right? All the n minus one data is here, all the n data is here, and here we have something that is using both the n and the n minus one data, which means that the n data needs to be at four different places at the same time, and that's not really something we can do using a standard dimension. So. What we, what we would do in order to um, fix these kind of issues is something called data densification. And we would do data densification using, uh, I mean, that's the way I do it actually, um, using the relationship model. So how to do that? Well, let's first take the data as it was displayed as a table. I just uh, moved the measure names from the rows to columns, but that's pretty much the same. What, what we would use and if you've already seen something online, usually you will see a tutorial that will advise you to use a small Excel file like this one. For example, in my case, my bridge chart has five columns. So I have here my five IDs. I would most of the time find also a link uh, with a column only having once. And then we would edit 
our data source and we would perform a link between your data and the densification sheet. Here, the thing is, uh, if you want to display your data, what you will have to do is to create a link, one equal to one, and every single row of data from the others here is going to be linked, not joined, with your densification uh, worksheet. Well, to me, that's uh, one of the main sources of the issues when it comes to building custom charts. Um, once you're at work, you may not want to have a cross database join inside your data source. You may not want to link your data with an Excel worksheet because you may experience some, then I don't know, um, refresh scale issues and so on. So what I wanted to talk to you about is how the way I do it actually. So I, I'm here connected to my uh, SQL Server database my data comes from it and what i would like to do is to have the same worksheets but based on the database itself and not the excel file so i put together a small excel file like this one where i can just select and copy paste some um, some uh, functions and i would just use a custom sql this custom sql looks like that and i'm just allow, allowing here uh, my data to just well use the other one, but I'm just creating a union of SQL, not targeting even, not even a table. It's just something that is going to be built in memory that takes almost uh, no cost in terms of calculation and will give me directly my data, right? So now I have that. I have a link for every single row of my data source to this new table, logical table, containing my five IDs. Well, that's all I need if I want to create a bridge chart. I will go back to uh, my table, and here I will find back my data. So I can see that I have my two logical tables here, the orders, the density, and I can find here my IDs. Now, the great thing about the relationship model is that it preserves the values of the KPIs, which means that here, as I'm not using any uh, item from the densif densify sheets, here I can see that I have all my KPIs from sales minus one to sales n, I've got all the good numbers and everything is uh, working perfectly. As soon as I bring my ID, I can see that Tableau now does a link between the two items uh, inside my data source, and I can see that every single value is repeated, right? So Tableau is able to link those two data to replicate it onto the, the five IDs I've got. But if I don't use it, the value is preserved. It's still the same and it's not destroyed at all. We are not... Um, making our, our number of rows completely explode, everything is still fine. And as soon as we've got that, then we can perfectly build a bridge chart. We just need a few calculations. We're going to start with a header and we are going to add also a value, right? So just <clears throat> defining the different cases uh, onto the dimension, the new one that we have, which is called ID, we are going to define different headers from sales minus one to sales n. And we are going to add also something called the bridge value. I needed to use here the maximum of the ID because, uh, of course, my uh, indicators, they are already aggregated, but it's not really uh, an issue for me. So now I'm able to put together something like that using those IDs to define a header and define a value. If I have that, then I just need to go to the second step. I just need to follow any kind of waterfall uh, tutorial online and see that I need also to use GAN bars to, to use a position and defining a position, having my own running total here of my bridge value, I'm able to create this worksheet, which does not use anymore. The measure values is just based on the bridge position, bridge value, bridge header that I used also uh, on the colors here, and I have my different headers. I'm of course allowed to hide the header and I have a perfectly working bridge chart, which is going to uh, not to rely on any Excel worksheet and also to be completely dynamic according to the different filters I will use in my orders data. So that's the first thing I like about the relationship, and but that's not the only usage. Uh, when it comes to building custom charts, we would also talk about drawing curves. And when we talk about drawing curves, we talk about creating stuff like that. Well, this one actually does not need anything. You can directly do that with Tableau. Again, you'll find quite a lot of tutorials, but it's going to be my starting point in order to go a bit further with this. So here I'm starting with a small uh, chart, which is um, working with parallel coordinates and I'm having three calculations, uh, rank of the average profit, the rank of the sum of sales and the rank of the quantity. 
Now, let's imagine that Tableau would not be able to draw the line between the, three, the dots that I'm representing here. And let's imagine that we would need ourselves to draw a curve, which would go, for example, from this point to this one. How would we do that? Well, let's make it even a bit more simpler because actually if we can do it between two ranks, we will be able to do it between, between three of those. I'm just going to consider the two first items. How would I do that? Well, first what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the exact same technique that I showed you before. I'm going to link my data to a different custom SQL query. That time I did not take five items. items. I took 10 of those so that I have a bit more points. And I'm going to start with a table like this, having the different ranks just displayed for the different subcategories I'm looking at. So let's draw 10 points. How would we draw 10 points? We would need to proceed in a few steps. And I try to describe those here. So let's put together a small table, all my subcategories, the rank of the profit, the rank of sales. And I have here my 10 points, right? My 10 IDs that I'm going to use to draw my line inside Tableau. First thing I got to do, I'm going to display different uh, points, right? Gradually go from the rank of profit to the rank of sales. So what I need to define is a step which is going to, to tell me this is the first point, the second point, the 10th point, and now you reached the sum of sales, the rank of sales. So here I did something extremely simple. I just built a, a straight line, just divided basically my ID uh, by 10. I just added a minus one and a minus one here so that um, it goes from zero to one. As soon as I have something that goes from zero to one, and that's the key if you want to draw curves in Tableau, you need something that will go from zero to one. As soon as you've got that, well, you can reuse this calculation and you can apply it to your rank and profit of profit and your rank of sales. Basically, what we want is to gradually make the profit disappear and gradually make the sales appear, right? So we're going to create a first step, invert the, um, the order of the, the first calculation we've made with the step so it doesn't go from zero to one, but from one to zero, so one minus my step. And I'm going to multiply it by the profit. So I go from the value two that I can find here, and gradually I decrease it to zero. I'm going to do the same also with the sales, but that time I take just the standard uh, step calculation that I have here. I start at zero, and I just multiply it by the steps I have, and I end up on the 10th point, multiplying my rank of sales by one, which gives me my, my, my rank sum of sales. Well, if I'm able to build those two steps, I'm able to combine them also, and I will put those into a more complex calculation to read, but not a more complex one in terms of uh, how it works. It's basically the same thing. I'm starting with the rank of profits, and gradually from zero to one, I'm adding the sales and I'm sub subtracting the profits. As soon as I have that, then I'm able to transform my worksheet and to draw this line, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove my measure values. I'm going to remove also my measure names. And I'm going to <coughs> take those items I defined, right? Let's first use my steps so that I can find my 10, my 10 points. And so my steps, they will need to work with the IDs. Oh, I'm going to put them here. Let's define my step here. I will compute it using my IDs. So I have 10 points. And then I will use my combined two and three steps that I called here uh, four. And I will also edit the table calculation. This one is a nested table calculation. So I need to define it on several areas. The rank of profit is made using the subcategories. The rank of sales is made the same way. And I need also to define my step and say that my step is actually built using the IDs, right? Well, I think we are getting there, right? We have different steps, different dots that are uh, getting aligned. Of course, if I want to have the same chart, I need to edit my axis and to reverse the chart. But that's where I am, right? I've got everything I needed in order to create these steps. Well, if I would now just change from line to circle, well, congratulations, we've built something that we could do without using any data identification, right? OK, let's go a bit further then. How do we go from this drawing points, drawing straight lines, 
to something that goes a bit further, drawing still lines, curves, but with a different formulas, right? Well, the only thing you need to do is to change this very first calculation I've been talking about, which is the step that goes from zero to one. Mine was just a straight line going from uh, with an increment of 0 0.1, but you can use pretty much everything you want. One of the most known one is called the sigmoid function. I will uh, spare you the, the formula, but I can display you right after. Basically, the only thing I need to go from this to this is to replace here the first calculation that you see here with this one. It's just still a curve that is going from 0 to 1, but just with different speed depending on the advancement from the first to the last point. So, well, it doesn't look that good here because I have only 10 points, but if you do the same with maybe 30, 50, of course, you're, you're gonna end up with something very much, very much more smooth. Here, I just want to highlight this blog post. Uh, you will find it also in my Tableau file that, that I will give you afterwards. It's written by Jeffrey Schiffer. I hope you heard about him. Uh, here, uh, you will find different formulas and equations that you can use that are going from zero to one and that you can use to shape your uh, different datas uh, and charts that you're going to create. Uh, you can even test them here. So you will see with a multi-level Sankey chart, uh, something very cool to use and to know. Now, <clears throat> what if instead of just drawing a line going from the beginning to the end, right? From the profits to the sales, we would do something a bit more complex. We would add more points. Here I'm, I've, I'm using hundreds of, of them. And what if instead of that, we would use the first, fifth, the first 50 points to go from the profit to the sales and the last 50 to go back from the sales to the profit. Well, we would be able to create something like that. I highlighted some of the, the items and the IDs that I have here on the pink and the blue one. But here, what I've done is just make the way there and back. And I added on my y-axis also just a small distance between the way there and the way back, right? I added plus uh, 25 here and I uh, took out 20, uh, minus 25 here inside my calculation. So what I've done here is that I just created exactly the same thing, just tiny bit more complex. And I have now more points and I'm going the way there and the way back. Well, I could just end up with that and I have a very cool uh, chart that I've created, but this is what's needed if you want to go further and if you want to use the so-called polygons. Everything that you will need to know and use if you want to build, I don't know, radial charts, uh, Sankey charts, whatever kind of diagrams that uses a shape that, that does not really exist in Tableau, except for cats emojis, those are shapes. Uh, here, basically, that's the only thing you knew, You need to know. You need to know how to draw a curve. And then you need to know that if you make all the borders of the shape that you want with the curve, then you can switch to polygon and you can have something fancier. Um, <clears throat> so we know now that the relationship model helps you to um, add new dimensions, to reshape your data, to draw curves, that if you draw curves, you can uh, again then turn them into polygons. And basically, we start to understand that with Tableau, it's only an X axis, a Y axis, and you can basically draw whatever you want. You're mainly limited by your creativity. So yes, of course, you can create fancy stuff like this um, that was uh, done by uh, Bo McCready, but you can also build very dumb stuff like that, right? That's a polygon with a blue square. Well, I took quite a lot of energy to actually not build a blue square, but a cube in Tableau. Well. It's something that you can just build, building polygons. You just build the six faces of the cube. You animate them, you add some points so that you can see it moving with an history, uh, with showing history and, and pages. I'm not sure if Bevy is gonna allow me to do that. But basically, as soon as you can draw a shape, a closed shape with a curve, you can turn it into a polygon and then you can build whatever you want. Here, that's just a cube built of, out of six faces that I can put back together. Now they are three by, they are two by two. And if I remove that, it's just back again, the same cube that you've seen before. So that's always the way it works, right? And if you see some kind of complex stuff like this, for example, any kind of radial bar charts, this one has a two level, but it's basically the same thing. You can turn off the polygons, see how it works, turn it into a line, and you will see that it's again, the same thing, different kind of lines, 
that are making the border of a shape that we want to use and then turning it into polygons. It's basically every time the same. But what about the radio charts? Well, that's something that is uh, very obscure for a lot of people that some people don't really want to understand sometimes. This is my try for you to uh, get uh, more comfortable with how this is working. So let's take a small line going from zero to one and let's just distribute three points on it, right? That's something that everyone can do. You take a child, you tell, you tell him, uh, put three dots on the line. Most probably they are gonna be evenly distributed and you will have something like this having three lines, uh, three the dots, first one at zero, last one at one, and the first one is at one and uh, one half. So if we try to understand how we do that when we do it instant, uh, instinctively, well, we basically took one, which is the length of our um, line, times an increment for the points, zero, one, and two, and then divided by the number of points minus one, right? Well, if we proceed and if, if we do the same with a line that is a bit bigger, so from zero to two, we do exactly the same. We put two point, three points again, and we do exactly the same in terms of calculation, right? Two, which is the length of the line, times zero divided by three dots minus one, so two, two times one divided by two, etc. Now, what if the line's length is now two times pi? Well, it's still exactly the same. We still have our three dots, we still have our formulas that's working, and we now distributed three points on the line that is uh, of a length of two times pi. Why am I talking about that? Well, <clears throat> we all learned at school that the perimeter of a circle is two times pi times the radius, right? So let's take a radius of one, two times pi is the perimeter of a circle uh, for uh, having a radius of one. So if we are able to do that, we are now able to distribute this on the line, we should be able to put this on the circle. How would we do that? Well, uh, first, we need to know that it's not going to work, right? We need to actually move a bit the different dots because if I turn this line on a circle, then I'm going to have the yellow one and the blue one overlapping, right? Because they are both at the edges of the line. So if I try to close it into a circle, it's, they are going to overlap. So we're going to switch tiny bit the calculation in order to have like we would have if we would have four points. And then, of course, the formula needs to be a bit more adapted. So it's now going to be something like that, one, two, three, and we divide by three as we would have four points and not three, right? Well, the magic happens with the functions sinus and cosinus. I will spare you the math, but basically, if you take this, just this formula I've just shown you, and if you apply the cosinus, you will end up with your x-axis. If you apply the sinus, you will end up uh, with a synaxis, and this can all be proven with the Pythagore theorem, but we don't, we are not doing that today. So as soon as you know how to distribute some points evenly on the line, you basically know how to do that on a circle. And you know then that if you can draw a curve straight or with whatever calculation, you can also turn it into something radial because you just need then to apply cosinus and sinus. Guess what? We talked about Sankeys, we talked about um, radial charts. Uh, I would advise you to read these um, nowadays on Tableau Public and until I think the 30th of June, we have the opportunity to try two new chart types and those are Sankey charts and radial charts. I would advise you to go uh, see the Tableau Public web edition and you will see that you can actually now create Sankey charts and radial charts way more easily than before. Uh, it doesn't mean what I'm telling you uh, is uh, not relevant anymore. You will still need to use it for any kind of different charts, but uh, that's a big step for, for all of us, I think. And that's something that is, uh, I find actually pretty cool. Now, last thing I want to talk about, I will actually go quite uh, quickly with that. I'm not he um, trying here to explain uh, everyone how map layers are working or uh, <laughs> neither of that. I mean, it would take a whole session. But if you heard about the map layers, if you've seen some of the analytics tech that have been done also on this subject, uh, you should know that the map layers, of course, they can be used to uh, create some maps, but they can also be used to create some custom charts. And for example, this is a custom chart using the map layers. You may have seen this from Adam McCann, which is uh, actually just one single Tableau worksheet uh, where, where he just recreated everything. And uh, I mean, that's something uh, which uh, 
kind of a, is a genius one. Um, but yeah, you can now use the map layers to not to be limited uh, on the number of um, marks that you're displaying inside your data. You can use the map layers to have however how many marks you want inside one same worksheet and then one same chart. I'm just going to talk about this specific example I built for the presentation and how would we build this inside Tableau. I just want first to highlight the fact that I'm using longitude and latitude here, right? So this is a map. This is clearly a map. And if I would show my header and if I would display both axes here, you will see that actually it goes from 0 0.2 to 1.3 for the y axis and minus 0 0.2 to 1.3 for the x-axis. What have I done here? Well, basically, what you can do is to use the make point functions to define some points wherever you want on a map. And they can be fixed. Here, for example, I've defined a point having a lat I always get confused with that, a latitude of 1.2 and a longitude with 0 0.5, right? Well, you can also draw curves with that, right? You can also, for example, do something like that, define several make points and recreate existing charts. That is exactly what I've done here with my area charts. I created this make point curve and it's just made of different circles that I've placed on um, my data. And if I turn it into a line, I've got a line chart. If I turn into an area chart, I end up with an area chart. Now. What you want to do and to know if you want to recreate that is that, of course, given the axes I'm using, I needed to recalculate every single position of this chart to do it, right? And you need here, if you want to achieve something like that, to know about data normalization, right? Basically, what I want when I create this kind of chart is to make sure that this chart is stuck between 0 and 1 on the x-axis, 0 and 1 on the y-axis. Why would I do that? Just to make sure that I can control the height and the width of my chart so that every single other item I would display on my chart won't overlap with anything else. How do we do that? Well, I will just take the example for the uh, sales normalized, but what I would do is just uh, nested LD, we all love that. Uh, I would take the sum of sales and I would divide it then by the maximum sum of, uh, monthly sum of sales that I that is displayed here. And so that I know that the highest point will be at one and then everything work like it would be percentages. So just summarizing it up, uh, these both are created using map layers. Basically, they don't look like a map, but it's still everything the same. Uh, using the map layers to have different mark, mark types, drawing curves, densification, everything I, I just told you about. If you want to create exactly this worksheet, then you, you will need those kind of calculation. You will find those also in the workbook, but basically that's a make point between the Y axis, which is normalized and the X axis that is normalized too. Um, last thing I want to talk about, uh, because I mean, that comes from maybe the past where the map layers did not exist, but if somehow you can't, you can't or you don't want to use the map layers, for example, because you need table calculations and you won't be able to put those into a make point. There is also this blog post written by Chris DiMartini um, some time ago, but it's still very much relevant. And this helps you to leverage, again, the relationship power in order to create different kind of mark that you will be able to use inside your data. And then it will also allow you to create, for example, stuff like that, which was my timeline for my Tableau resume, uh, which is basically different kind of marks, some dots, some shapes, some lines, not using any map layer, but you can still layer your data, have different subtracts, and then do whatever you want with that. Um, trying to end on time, I want to uh, say many thanks for inviting me here, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, very glad that I had this opportunity to share also the spot with uh, such talented speakers. Uh, feel free to hit me on LinkedIn if you want to discuss and uh, that was all for me. Thank you. Awesome, thanks a lot, Maxime. That was definitely another Power Packs presentation.
And so just a reminder for everyone, um, we do have these sessions recorded, so you can check this out later. And I'm going to just quickly browse and see if we got some questions here. Mm. Okay, so I think we're good here. So if you need to connect with Maxine, please do so um, on LinkedIn, Twitter, Tableau Public. You can check his stuff out there and um, you know connect with him on what you need. And so I'm going to pass it back to Annabelle to help us close out in the last few moments here. And so over back to you, Annabelle. Thank you. I will still try to speak. <laughs> I really enjoy the, all the presentations. Thank you very much for uh, joining. Uh, we will send like a wrap up uh, with all the links. So I will ask uh, all the speakers to send me everything you want uh, to be included. And we uh, please register for the next session. <laughs> we hope that we have, will have less issue next time. And uh, yeah, not very thank you. It was a very, very awesome presentation. And thank you for the audience too, to be uh, such a nice crowd. Thanks, Rats. And now I stop the recording.